all my students. Welcome to my second class of the week, Literature of the West. Hopefully you're enjoying this uh, with all these different kinds of uh, American authors and their different backgrounds. So this class is for 8, 17, 20. Let me check with the calendar. Yes, Monday 8, 17, 20, August 17, 2020. This is a secret. The seventh week. You're not supposed to know that. So that's the seventh week, right? But day 17, 20. Hopefully everybody's doing okay. If you're in my history class, hopefully you're enjoying the Asian history also. All right. So today we're going to talk about Allen Ginsberg, who was, uh, I guess, a leftist writer considered at the time. Very controversial. 60s, uh, not part of the what was considered the mainstream society at the time. So a little similar to Mr. Baldwin, that we read about earlier, but uh, some other different issues. So uh, without further ado, I guess I'll get started on this and uh, try to give it the time that it needs because a lot of little uh, tidbits of information here, okay? So let me go to material. Okay, I guess I'll again minimize my face. You don't need to see me, just listen to me. I don't wanna block any important information that you might read. I don't know how sensitive my students can be. I can't read this. I don't know what it says. It was two letters, I-S. So let's get into that. Allen Ginsberg, 1926, was born and died 1997. He was a poet. as a core, and core means center. Now we just hear core used as a, oh, I'm exercising my core, my uh, abdomen, but core means the center, the focal point of something. So as a core member of what became known as the Beat Writers, uh, beat, we're not talking about the verb to beat someone with our fist or beat someone with a stick. It's more talking about uh, a noun as the beat or the pulse of something. So they're trying to say this was the pulse, the beat, the rhythm of what was going on at the time, at least with this group of writers felt, and they felt they were representing a certain uh, portion of society. I guess a translation that young people use now, uh, if it would be this time, they would probably call them the vibe, because people go someplace, oh, how's the vibe? Oh, we've got the current vibe here. So that's what beat meant here in the 60s. So whose members included Jack Kerouac and uh, William S. Burroughs. Allen Ginsberg wrote poetry that voiced his alienation from a materialistic post-war American society. And again, realize this is his view. Just because he felt this or Burroughs or Kerouac doesn't mean that other people felt this way. Okay. And alienation means you are not part of something or a group. And a lot of times people are actually like, you could be in a religion and then they find out you do things that are against your religion and then people will not talk to you anymore and you can't go to church. So you're alienated, right? And this is how, as you'll see, a certain way he had his personality and things that he believed in. He felt alienated. 
that Joseph uh, uh, <laughs> after World War II, the society was materialistic and they wanted things. But again, this is his feeling. Uh, so try to look at both sides of things when people just come forward with assertions, right? Using his own life as poetic material, Ginsburg wrote long rambling. So rambling is when they just kind of go on and they sound the same. It sounds like someone saying, bura, 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 bura. You really have to listen to the words of what they're saying, but that's what they sound like. They ramble on. And that echoed his natural speaking cadence. Ooh, some tough words there. Echo, I don't know if you know what an echo is, but uh, if anybody's been to the Grand Canyon, usually people will yell or they're in the center of the Grand Canyon. So, hello, and then you'll hear hello, 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 hello. That's an echo. So, and it's speaking cadence is the rhythm or speed in which you do something. So, he felt these rambling poems, you know, echo, hello, 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 his natural speaking speed. So, I guess he's thinking of this is really, really me. I'm really being, in other words, that young people use now, authentic. Is controversial, which means a lot of people did not like it at the time, or got upset by it. Poem, howl. So, howl is something a wolf does or a dog does, I guess canines in the that phylo or kingdom of animals. So if you've ever been around a dog and a police stay, uh, police car goes by with the siren, woo, woo, a lot of times this agitates dogs at their hearing level. So they will, woo, they will howl. So his poem was called Howl, but it wasn't a dog howling. It was his howl of being upset and what bothered him. So in which he wrote about his homosexuality. Again, at that time, we did not have gay pride parade. We did not have the term LGBTQ. We did not even have the term gay. Gays took that word. Like I've said in other classes, I remember being a boy and you could read a book to the teacher and say, I had a gay time or I felt gay. All gay meant was happy. So uh, to my understanding, homosexuals did not like the term homosexual even though it was a medical term and said, we prefer to be called gay. So again, not accepted the way it is now. And then drug use, which also was, there was no uh, legal marijuana at the time, even for medical. People could go to prison for having marijuana. And uh, he brought his friend and publisher, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, obscenity charges. Okay, so that is a police term. Obscene is something that, this is gonna be hard for me to really translate for you, but I will do my best. So something obscene is, if you've heard the term gross, and, uh, it should not be seen in public or at this point, this book it should not have been talked about because people did not openly talk about homosexuality or really drug use. At the time, you were just a drug addict. So, uh, obscenity charges were brought against it. Okay, the bottom of the page, <coughs> excuse me, his first reading. So I'm just, you know, myself, I'm just curious if these things are no longer considered obscene by obscenity. What is left that seems to be obscene? Maybe a man in the middle of Cape Town, homeless guy dropping his pants and doing a number two in front of a bunch of traffic. I guess that would still be obscene. Something 
that's the level you have to see of something being not ugly or bad to look at, but just obscene. So it's a higher, higher level. Okay. So I'm at the bottom of the first page. So you know that means question time. Okay. So let me go over there. Whiteboard. Get the pencil. I hope everybody's surviving the heat that we're having out there. I'm going to give a little surprise. Yesterday with the short pair, not yesterday, but the last class with the short paragraphs, I was maybe too kind, only one question. Maybe two, but usually one. Uh, today I got to give more motto. Okay. There goes a the machine again playing tricks with me. Okay, so number one, Innsberg was a core member of what? I have a funny guy in here like a Timu or Alex. Not Ochir, Ochir is a good guy, he's a straight up guy. I like that Ochir, gives me no trouble. Uh, Timu might say, Something funny like, oh, Ginsburg was a core member of a 24-hour fitness. That's not what I'm asking here. Okay. It's a group, not a gym membership. Number two. Two. What kind of poetry did he write? Did he write about sheep, candies, or little girls picking flowers? Uh, I don't think so. So, what kind of poetry did he write? What was his style? What was he trying to say? That people should drink less Coca Cola? Is that what the issue was? Number three, and the final question. Yes, I'm not going to give you four on this small little page. Uh, his poem, Howl, oh, right, was about what? What was Howl about? Was it about a dog that drank too much soju and then would yell at the moon? What was this about? So I'll give you a few to write those down. Oh, and uh, Nishwan, just to let you know, that would be a very tiny part of 138. Okay, so Mark 138 is gone. Okay. 
So we're going to let me get that eraser now or somebody hides it. Okay, eraser, Toco. okay, Toco. here we go. Number one, Ginsburg was a core member of 24 hour fitness, if that's what you believe. Two, what kind of poetry did he write? Let's say he wrote poetry about clowns in the circus. Three, his poem, How oh, was about, I think it was about a dog that drank too much alcohol. So I yelled at the moon. It was uh, confused. Okay. All right, that one's gone. There we go. Back to the vivacious writing. Okay, so you see we stopped here. First writing, so. Let me get the book to match along so we don't get lost because it's very easy for that to happen. All right. So his first reading of Howell at San Francisco's Six Gallery in October 1955 heralded, so that's kind of like successfully brought in a new thing, brought in the news of something new, which was the poetry renaissance in that city. So when we use the term renaissance for something, it means kind of like a rebirth or a second understanding of something that went prior. So. I don't know when poetry was first popular in San Francisco, but obviously it was a long time before 1955. So when he came and read his poetry and his other core members at 24 Hour Fitness, it brought it back in style, in popularity in that city, being San Francisco. And what is considered Ginsburg's greatest work? Caddish, not, I know James is getting hungry, but it's not radish, it's caddish. He wrote about the mental illness and death of his mother. He was a political and social activist, speaking out against the Vietnam War. Homosexual intolerance, so intolerance means if you do not put up with someone or something or some group, you just don't put up with it. And he wanted, at the time, homosexuality to be accepted. And the environmental degradation by corporations. Degradation, we keep on getting this, all the different forms of destruction. So a lot of big uh, multi-million dollar at the time corporations to do their thing, whatever it is, oil or what have you, they would destroy the environment while they were extracting or doing it is whatever they were doing. He was awarded the National Book Award for a poetry collection the fall of America. In later years, he became a member of the prestigious American Academy, Institute of Arts and Letters. Allen Ginsberg was born in Newark, New Jersey, June 3rd, 1926. He and his older brother, Eugene, lived with their father, Lewis, a poet. See, so his father was already a poet, so I guess he inherited some skill there, or at least was exposed to it and had a liking or love for 
poetry. And his father was also a high school teacher, English teacher. Oh dear. And their mother, Naomi. Ginsburg mother suffered from severe mental illness. She endured frightening, frightening is worse than scary. Uh, you might see a spider and get scared, but if you see a ghost coming at you, you probably get frightened, it's a higher level. So episodes are occasions. She endured frightening episodes of paranoid psychosis in which she believed mind draining wires protruded from her head. Okay. When you're paranoid, that means you're overly nervous about something. So a lot of people have described uh, being at the home homes of uh, people who do, let's say, cocaine, some kind of drug, and once they bring it out and they start doing it, they get really, really paranoid and think that the police are in the backyard or that the police are on the roof. So it's not true, that's just their insecurity. So at a high level, it's a psychosis. And she believed the wires were sticking out from her head, that's what it means to protrude. And I don't know about the mind draining exactly what that was doing. She was losing thought or was telling her different things, but these are the episodes that she had. While he was a junior in high school, Ginsburg's mother, begged him to take her to a therapist at a nearby nursing home for treatment. She would spend the rest of her life in psychiatric institutions, AKA hospitals, clinics, undergoing electric shock therapy and a lobotomy before dying at Pilgrim State Hospital in 1956. At that time, it was very popular when people had mental issues that they couldn't get over. They would connect their heads to some wires and give them electric shock, thinking that this would take away the mental psychosis. A lot of times it just uh, damaged their memory. And then the worst thing is the next one, the lobotomy, which I don't know when they stopped doing that. But again, for people who had this kind of psychosis or people that they felt were, because it was used in the prison system, so too violent, they would give you a surgery, open your skull and take a, small piece of your brain and cut it out and say, this is the area that's causing this person to be crazy, or this is the area that's making the person be violent. And a lot of times that just completely destroyed their personality. And they were more or less like a zombie after that. I'm glad they stopped doing that just the utter craziness. Even though I'm hearing some bad rumors now that people are trying to bring back shock therapy. Some people said, oh, it worked on me. Like, uh, well, you asked me, hell no, I won't go. But uh, I don't know, it takes all kinds, right? We're in the middle now of... Uh, the left side of 139 is uh, Schwann. Naomi Ginsburg's illness 
would have a profound effect on her younger son. This is a main point in this reading of Mr. Ginberg's uh, biography. To have a profound effect on her means, it's like saying 100% uh, effect on her and not negative. He had feelings of guilt, right? And uh, that he couldn't help her, couldn't be with her at certain times and where he felt that she needed him. So uh, you can also have a profound effect on, on someone in a positive way too as a role model or a mentor, so but, uh, profound. Or medical speaking, uh, let's say someone's been a lifelong severe alcoholic. So when they got older, it uh, caused them to maybe have a foot cut off or a both feet cut off. Now they have severe liver damage, and unless they get a liver transplant, they will die within a year, let's say. So these are profound effects on your health from drinking the, uh, too much alcohol over too many years. In later years, Innsbruck po poetry would try to encompass all that his mother's life and illness had meant to him. So here's an explanation. When you say encompass, it means to cover all this poetry, reading about her, performing, would try to cover all the points of his mother's life and her illness and what it had meant to him. So that's what encompass means. So uh, it can be used. In another way, let's say you're a chef and you're representing a certain country's cuisine. Let's say it's a Thai cuisine. So I think I still have Sidi Mooch in his class. So actually, I, yeah, I'll tell you that Sidi Mooch, you haven't been here that long, but let's say, my God, calm down. Okay, let's say 20 years ago, okay, when I was 10 years old, in Thai town, in a restaurant on top of the plaza, and they tried to encompass all of the regions, uh, major regions of Thai food. So in the center was a, like a Bangkok, <coughs> in the center food, and then the left was an Eastern, and then the right was a West Thai, Thailand. And then they had the Southern dishes on the other side. So they tried to encompass all the major regions of Thai food. Fortunately, it was not a success. Uh, her mental illness brought complex feelings to a boy who already felt outcast for being homosexual. So again, complex is not easy, right? Anything complex is not easy, right? I don't know why these things are. Things have to be complex. I wish more things in life could be simple, but, uh, you know, that's why some people can be kind to someone at the beginning and then later treat them with more respect. So complex feelings. And his complex feelings were in the mainstream society, he felt to be an outcast. And an outcast is someone who's not wanted. So obviously he could not announce like today his homosexuality. So he felt an outcast in the main part of society. After graduating from Eastside High School, he entered Columbia University, which is a very prestigious university, on a scholarship in 1943. He intended to study law to please his father. Again, that's a very common theme, I think, worldwide. Young people, especially boys, try to make the father happy, whether it's to study law or be a doctor or 
could be a sports player, you name it. But his plans changed when he started to hang around campus with a motley, <laughs> it's a funny word, motley group of friends. Uh, very rare to hear this word nowadays. But uh, it's a kind of a negative connotation. You know, if your mother would say, what a motley group of friends. So these guys don't look educated, maybe look a little dirty or involved with some kind of jopo or pachinko guys. Maybe the kind of group of friends that people might not be comfortable with at first. But that's who he hung around with. Uh, the group of men with whom Ginsburg met included Lucy and Carr. You don't have to know these names, don't worry. Some of them are quite famous. Uh, William S. Burroughs is very famous, but you don't have to worry about what he wrote or anything. I won't ask you. Things like that. Jack Kerouac is very famous. John Cleon Holmes. There you go, a drug addict from Times Square in New York. So what mom is gonna like that? Who are you hanging out with? The, the football captain? Are you hanging out with the chess club? Are you hanging out with the scholars? It's like, well, I got a buddy, he's a drug addict from Times Square. You know, mom that might not be too happy about that. And his name was uh, Herbert Hunky, and a drifter from Denver named Neil. Cassidy. Drifter is also not a thing that has been traditionally respected. Uh, I do know the Japanese word for that. That's a food eyeball. So a drifter kind of like goes from one city to the next, doesn't want to settle down, doesn't want to get a job. Just kind of, hey man, I like LA, but I was in San Diego. And then before that I was in Vegas. Now I'm in San Francisco. I don't know where I'm going next or what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna enjoy the marijuana here. So again, probably not a guy your mom would be wanting you to hang out with, but these are the people he chose to hang out with. I guess he felt a certain kind of kinship with them. Together, they formed the core of what became known as the beat writers. These were the beat guys. The term beat came about when Jack Kerouac used it to describe their, the group's, feeling of spiritual depletion. So they were like done with spirituality, they're depleted. And alienation from a society they viewed, so they they viewed, even though it was a drug addict, a drifter, and on and on, they viewed society as hypocritical. When you're hypocritical, it means you say one thing and do another. So let's say if I, I spotted uh, Timu and Bernie smoking cigarettes at the Starbucks, and I told them, you guys got to stop smoking. <laughs> it's terrible for your health. Are you gonna promise me? Okay, yeah, yeah, teacher, we're gonna stop smoking. And then later they see me someday and I'm smoking. So I should not be telling them to stop smoking if I'm doing it, that makes me a hypocrite. So they viewed the mainstream American society as hypocritical, materialistic. I, I don't know if they ever stated exactly what they felt was materialistic. Somebody wanted to have a home, because a drifter doesn't want a home or they wanted to buy a nice car. I don't know if that was clearly stated. And then spiritually bankrupt. So they felt the people themselves were away from God, did not really have God in their life. It was not long before Ginsburg fell in love. So that brings me to the bottom of the left-hand side of 139. Okay. So back to the ever loving white board. <laughs> Do -do -do. Hope everybody's doing well. Okay. Oh, 
Let's jump four. Little easy answer, just thrown in there to the mix. What was considered his greatest work? It's mentioned in there, so I just need a name. That simple. So I don't want no funny guys like Ken saying, what well, was considered his greatest work? Oh, when he worked at McDonald's. Uh, that's not what I'm asking. Ken, I know you're a funny guy from Seattle. The true leader of CHOP. Okay. I will now move on to the next question. Okay, question five. What was he awarded for his poetry collection? Okay, let me stretch this out for you. All right. So what was he awarded for his poetry collection? Was he awarded since it was Controversial at the time, was he awarded a free one week stay at uh, Alcatraz prison in San Francisco so he could smell the sea air? Was that what he was awarded at the time? Okay. Do I have one more on this page? Oh, yes, I do. Teachers being mean. Let me get those questions out there. Kuchin loves those questions. Okie dokie maroki. Six, beat was meant to describe what? Was it meant to describe the Michael Jackson song, Beat It? Right? Do, 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 do. Is that what it was meant to describe? Or was it meant to describe how Tull would not marry Timu because she would beat him up if he kept on running away to the Starbucks? What was the meaning of beat? Or just beat some eggs into submission, okay? So let me give you a few to Write those down, and make my markings. Questions, page, so this one, that would be 139 on the left-hand side. Please take your time on those. I know those are some controversial questions.
and I'm drink oh by the way I'm not drinking any sake tonight so or soju. Just vodka. No, just kidding. Okay, is it eraser time? There we go. A four, what was considered repeating his greatest work. And Ken says it's his job at McDonald's. I would say maybe when he worked at uh, Food for Less. Good thing he didn't get the E. coli like the Food for Less on Sunset. Five, what was he awarded for his poetry collection? Again, Alex will tell you. Two weeks at Alcatraz in prison to smell the sea air. Six, beat was meant to describe one. If you're a Michael Jackson fan, you know how to answer that. If you're tall, you might have a different answer for that. Sorry, team. Okay, those are done. Let me return to the fantastic, exciting, electrifying reading material. As you can tell, I'm excited. So getting the book, trying to match up the exact location here. We ended up here with Ginsburg fell in love. And this here will be the top of 139 on the right though. Okay, so here we go. Well, Ginsburg fell in love with the charismatic Neil Cassidy and a relationship followed. So if somebody is charismatic, they have charisma, which means people cannot stop looking at them or wanting to listen to them, either speak or sing. So uh, I'm sure my class has many charismatic men, maybe even sit, oh, well, I don't know, we'll see. Oh, oh, oh cheers, charismatic, that, that's for sure. Uh, Cassidy continued to pursue or seek out heterosexual affairs at the same time. So obviously that did not make Ginsburg very happy because from what it says here, he was 100% homosexual, fell in love with Cassidy and expected him to stay true to him, but uh, Cassidy wanted to be with a lot of women at the same time. So in today's terms, he would be uh, called bisexual. And obviously, I guess Ginsburg was not. Uh, Kerouac wrote about the couple's intense, strong, on fire relationship in his book, On the Road. Influenced by the work of Walt Whitman, William Blake, Ginsburg felt confined by the traditional poetry he had been studying at Columbia. Okay, I have to go into this a little bit here. The traditional uh, structure of Western poetry made him feel like put in a box and confined and he wanted to break out and do poetry in his own way. Um, so what do I have in here? This is from Japan, this is Nagawa. Uh, so I'm sure if you're from Japan and you study the haiku, haiku has certain rules. So if that's the only way you did poetry in Japan, some people say, I don't like these rules. I want to do haiku in a different style. And most artists usually eventually feel this way. Okay. 
during his senior year at Columbia, he began to experiment with drugs, or if you're from Liverpool, drugs. Got to get the drugs, man. So he began to experiment with drugs, hoping to achieve an altered state of being by which he could create poetry that bore a visionary meaning. Wow, it's gonna be rough. <laughs> Beyond rhythm and meter and pretty words and images. Okay, this is another venue that uh, many artists have done and still continue to do. An altered state means you're not in your normal state of being mentally or maybe even physically because of the drugs. And he hoped in that state, he could create a poetry. It says, bore a vision. So that means resembled a visionary meaning. Something you could really, really like see the poetry. You know, I've met musicians and they were telling me about their drug experiences because I lived at a record store. They would say, oh, when you take the drugs, you can actually see the musical notes or you could feel them. Things had color and meaning. And so he hoped that he would somehow give some kind of poetry reading that would be away from the rhythm of the poetry and meter, again, like haiku, having these certain rules, and even pretty images and words. So maybe more of a raw feeling, right? I, I'm not quite sure, I, I'm not a poet, so maybe he's trying to say, you know, I could write a poem about flowers and use pretty words about certain flowers and images so you see a yellow flower, but I want you to, from his drug uh, state, to maybe feel what it is to be a flower right? Something along those terms. I mean, that's at least my assumption. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough to say, you know. So let me see, we are at, um, okay, the top, no, actually quarter down. In 1949, Ginsburg was arrested for allowing Hunky to store stolen goods. Store means to put, keep in his apartment. So always be careful with, see, again, you've got these motley group of friends, drug addict, drifter, you really don't know truly their background and what they do. And a lot of times you can get in trouble just by being there. So uh, this reminds me of something I know from my past with someone. So I'll give you as a word of advice. If you have a motley group of friends or you hang out with people that say they used to have gang relations, be careful. I knew a young girl, teenage girl, that kind of hung out with a group like that. Maybe she liked one of the guys in there because he was cute. And one day they said, hey, um, you know, you have a car. Again, that's a bad sign too. All your friends don't have a car. And uh, did you drive us to the liquor store? We just want to buy some alcohol. And we're a little bit older than you, so we can buy it and then you can share. So she was excited about getting some free alcohol and hang out and have a good time with this one of the guys that she felt was cute. So she drove to the liquor store, then they all went inside. And a few minutes later, they ran out, ran out said drive fast well they had just robbed the liquor store and the owner had called the police the police caught them now she was not involved in the robbery 
knew nothing about it, but because she was driving the car, she got in trouble and had to go to jail. So here, Hunky got him in trouble and he was just trying to be a friend, Mr. Ginsburg. But luckily for him, instead of doing jail time, with the help of his professors, so see, professors are good. I don't know if I could get you out of jail if you came to me, uh, but uh, I would do my best. Ginsburg was placed in the Columbia Psychiatric Institute for eight months. That probably was not a good place to be either. That means, oh, he's crazy. So you don't know who you'd meet in there. He probably remembered his mother. It probably was a depressing time, but he did not want to go to jail either. During that time, he met and befriended a young writer named Carl Solomon. Who was being treated for depression. So now we're in the middle of the page. I mean, that would be 139 on the right side. After traveling to Mexico, 1953 to work at a Yucatan, and that's in the southern part of Mexico, close to Guatemala, to work at a Yucatan archaeological site. Ginsburg moved to San Francisco, where he met, fell in love with Peter Orlovsky. Sounds like a Russian fellow. Ginsburg settled down to a marketing research job thought about enrolling in a graduate program at the University of California at Berkeley. So again, thought about, it doesn't say he actually did it. So I guess if he fell in love with Peter Orlowski, he had gotten over uh, Neil Cassidy, which is good. In 1955, Ginsburg wrote an epic poem dedicated to Carl Solomon called Howl for Carl Solomon. Inspiration for the style of Howl came after Ginsburg read a poem by Jack Kerouac entitled Mexico City Blues in October at a gathering of poets and friends at the sixth gallery in San Francisco. So back in San Francisco, Ginsburg read the first part of Howell with Kerouac passing around jugs of wine. Wouldn't that be strange? We come back to school and we're in class and somebody's passing around jugs of wine no, that's why it was a private little hole-in-the-wall place where they could hang out in peace. So Kerouac passing around jugs of wine to the audience and slapping the side of a bottle while chanting, go! Ginsburg loosened up. That is a term for relaxing. I guess he was nervous and his body was stiff, but after downing some wine, the encouragement of Kerouac yelling go. He let the energy of the moment carry himself and his work. That means he really got into this reading and performance of the poet poem Howell. When he finished his reading, the crowd reacted with thunderous applause. So they're applauding, but it was so loud. In American culture, we say that sounds like thunder. Everyone agreed that something wonderful and defining had happened that night. It was, they thought, a cultural renaissance. And there is the word renaissance again. So something wonderful, mm, the liberation and ability to express 
homosexuality to a group of people and then it defined that was a defining moment now we're at the very bottom of the page though lawrence ferlinghetti owner of the city lights bookstore and city lights publishing Howell was published as a number four in the City Lights Pocket Poets series. After Howell's publication, the pocket booklets were quickly confiscated by the US, and you'll find out customs and San Francisco police. Um, confiscated means taken. Again, this word is usually used with the term of uh, the IRS, you don't pay your taxes. There's been many movie stars, singers, what have you, who didn't pay their taxes. And after so many years, the IRS sent their agents with guns to collect and confiscated the home, bank account, cars, you name it. So we're at the bottom of 139 on the right. And I have to go to the questions. So, do, do, do. let's go there. Back to the Zivait board. Okay. Pencil. How many questions do I? Oh, I don't have a lot. I'm sad. I thought I had a lot of questions there. I know it's going to make you guys happy. Seven, who was Ginsburg influenced by his writing? Which writers influenced him? Uh, could it be the writer who wrote Peanuts, Snoopy, Power Rangers? Who was Ginsburg influenced? And just to let you know, Again, it's the usual test material. There was a couple, so if you only write one, you will get less points than the person who writes two or three of his influences, okay? Okay, it looks like I'm only gonna have uh, two questions for you. I know it's gonna make you sad, but only two questions for you on 139 to the right. Makes me angry. I want to give you more. Because who was it? Nick Jen or Tall? I wanted 40 questions last time. Oh, it was Ball or Ma. That's who it was. Okay, our last question for this page. Uh, who did he fall in love with in San Francisco? So again, before Caroline says, who is he? What are you talking about? Uh, the same guy and all the other questions, Ginsburg. No change here, okay? Relax, Caroline. So who did he fall in love with in San Francisco? Let me stretch it out for you here. Uh, was it a baseball player? a musician, a drifter, a homeless man who was very handsome and had a nice pair of shoes. Who was it that he fell in love with? So let me give you a couple to write those down. And I'll make my markings.
cada más dos. Okay, I guess it's getting close to eraser time. So, as I get the eraser, I shall repeat, who was Ginsburg influenced by in his writing? And I will say the person who wrote Snoopy and the Peanuts, probably that person. AKA Charles Schultz. Eight. Who did he fall in love with in San Francisco? Again, any assortment. Or maybe he fell in love with a woman. Were you paying attention to the lecture? Better go back. Check it out. Date is done. Thank you. Okay. Back to the ever revealing uh, lecture. Okay, so we stopped here at the bottom. It says, after Howell's publication, the pocket booklets were quickly confiscated by. So now up here, customs in San Francisco police, or Wani and Lishuan brings us to the top of 139 on the right. So again, repeating customs and the San Francisco police. Uh, Ferlin Getty and his City Light store manager were arrested and charged with publishing and selling obscene material. Again, there is the word obscene, right? Because of the homosexual content of the poem and material. With support from members of the mainstream literary, so that's the main part of the culture, they, some members gave him some support in the literary community behind them and the American Civil Liberties Union defending them Berlin Getty and his store manager were found not guilty later in a court during a highly publicized trial in 1957. The judge ruled Howell had social importance. So I guess at that time, the, the, the judge felt, hey, you know, it's okay to publicize a homosexual romance, even though it was not done at the time, not published. Uh, Ginsburg left California after the trial with Orlovsky. He traveled to Paris to escape the furor created over Howell. So furor is the wild, I guess, negative media that was created over the uh, poem. Paris, nobody knew who he was, and nobody was talking about the poet or the poetry that they were in San Francisco. Uh, the couple returned to New York City in 1958. Ginsburg was a member of Timothy Leary's psychedelic community. Timothy Leary was a famous person um, that advocated drugs to reach a higher level. So this was at Millbrook, Millbrook College in upstate New York and continued to experiment with different drugs. So even as he got older, he still experimented with drugs and didn't say here that 
in other words, like when we read a part where he was in the uh, sixth gallery, and it was the wine that helped him loosen up. But it didn't, he didn't mention that. You know, when I tried earlier with the drugs to put my mind in a different area, he did not give them the credit at this time. So I, I don't know, I haven't heard it yet. He tried to make sense of his mother's suffering and death because again, he felt guilty. And of course, like anybody else, you wanna say, why, why my mother? Why did these things have to happen to the poor woman? And his relationship with her, he felt remorse and remorse is a sadness and a guilty feeling put together. Sometimes let's say two best friends get angry, and they fight, and they hurt each other. And then later, they both feel not only sad, but guilty. Why did I hit my good friend? And they feel remorse. This is kind of slipping away. A lot of people, unfortunately, now in American society, um, they do bad things to each other, and then they don't feel remorse later. I don't know why that is, but it used to be very common, though. People would say, I'm sorry. I lied to you, I'm sorry, I hit you, you're my best buddy, whatever, we won't do it again. So he felt remorse and guilt for not being there when she died, see, in 1956. While ingesting, which means swallowing or taking various drugs, Ginsburg wrote Haddish for Naomi Ginsburg, that's his mother's full name. Haddish was published in 1961 and was a overwhelming success, which means uh, very, very successful. And just to let you know, if I didn't read the page right, um, at least one, we're on actually 140. This stuff's going pretty quickly. Interesting life this fellow had. In 1962, while traveling in India, Ginsburg met with holy men, spiritual men, religious men, philosophical men, whom he asked for help in meditating. For a lot of Western people, meditation is very difficult. He was introduced to Buddhism and other Eastern philosophies. He realized during a train journey through Japan that meditation <coughs> was the key to enlightenment, not drugs. Um, the Japanese word for enlightenment is satori. Uh, Korean, I don't know what satori is in Korean, sorry. Uh, so that's when you reach that state mentally and spiritually where you're happy and at one with yourself finally realized <laughs> from the Japanese holy men that meditation was the key, not drugs. And again, it has not been stated where drugs actually took him where he needed to go for his poetry, but he found his answer with meditation. He returned to the United States in 1963, having written a poem about his experience called The Change. That's probably an interesting read. During the Democratic National Convention of 1968, held in Chicago, Ginsburg created a sensation when he mounted a makeshift stage, which means it wasn't a real stage. They kind of put it together with pieces of wood or boxes or trash cans and chanted, Om, Om, which Anybody has been in a temple or a monastery like me, it's usually what they say in a Buddhist monastery when they're trying to meditate. So he chanted Om while a clash, which means a fight between protesters and police played out before him at Chicago's Grant Park. He became the elder or oldest spokesman or people that spoke for a group for the next generation of anti-establishment. So his same thinking, anti-government, 
minded youngsters, the hippies. If you don't know who the hippies were, they were the long haired, flower power, drug taking, don't take a shower group who always said peace and love in the late 60s. Now at the very bottom of the page, in 1971, Ginsburg, along with poet Ann Waldman, created a writing program at the Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado, which they named the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. Naropa was the first Buddhist accredited university in North America. During the summer, Ginsburg taught poetry classes at Naropa, and then he headed east to lecture at Brooklyn College during the academic school year. And that brings me to the bottom of 140, as I corrected myself earlier, on the left-hand side. So let me go to the questions for that. Back to the whiteboard. I'm so happy today. My Mongolian brothers did not try to take my pencil not one time. Good for them. I give them respect. What was Ginsburg introduced to in India in 1962? Was it the dish of kare? Is that what he was introduced to? Be careful. I don't want you guys making this mistake. Someone might say something like that. Uh, maybe Pamela. Oh, Miss Titan. He was introduced to uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Well, look up here. It says what? not who, so don't jump the gun. So I'll say he was probably introduced to Indian Kare. Okay. Yes, I have another question on this page. Yay. Where did it pencil? Okay. So the last question for this page, being the left-hand side of 140. In Japan, what did he learn was the key to enlightenment? And again, enlightenment in Japanese is satori. It's when you reach your divine situation in your mind. Let me stretch that out. So what hints? Could I possibly give you for 10? In Japan, what did he learn to the key to enlightenment? For me, when I went to Japan, the key to my enlightenment was green tea ice cream. And I was able to eat a lot of green tea ice cream. I found enlightenment. But for Ginsburg, you have to read the material, yes? Okay, so let me give you a minute to do those. Let me make my markings. Put myself up here. So like I said, we have finished the left-hand side of page 140.
And we're cutting through pretty quickly on this week's Literature of the West lesson for 8-17-20. And I've noticed for the last 15 years or so that uh, as far as the regular time for the year, usually my feeling is uh, from August through December is the quickest time. It goes the fastest. Summer obviously goes slow. First part of the year, you're always thinking you're in the last part of the year before. But uh, August, uh, people are already wanting to get rid of the summer. In September, usually the college football and professional football start. And then October, we get a holiday, and then we get people are excited for three weeks trying to get ready for Halloween. Now adults as much as kids. And then three weeks after that, you have a Thanksgiving. And then you have a month before Christmas when people buy trees and do Christmas shopping. And then you get Christmas, and then you have a week until the start of the new year. So those are the reasons why I feel from August through December is the fastest time. Okay, so I'm gonna go for the eraser. Okay, and nine, repeating. What was Ginsburg introduced to in India in 1962? So what, not who. Pay attention to these minor things and you will do better on the exam. And I'm gonna say he was introduced to Hot, spicy, Indo curry. That's my hint. Okay, 10, Japan. What did he learn was the key to enlightenment? I told you for me, it was green tea ice cream. Maybe for Ginsburg, if I could give you a hint, it's probably wasabi. I said he ate like uh, a whole spoon, giant spoonful of wasabi, and it opened his mind like drugs, and he was able to understand poetry even better. Okay, that's my hint. Okay, 10 is gone. So, back to the lecture material. So, we stop here. And that brings us to the end of 140 on the left. So we have a very tiny, can you believe it? This area right here is the last part of 140. It's our last reading. Oh, wow. Banzai. That's it. But you know, I still might have a question or two. So we got to go through this class. So let's uh, end this with a flourish. Right. It looks like you still go a little bit early anyway, so don't worry. Uh, Ginsburg continued to speak out against the government's drug policies. And again, they were very strict, you know, just even having a small amount of marijuana and you could uh, go to prison. Um, I guess now the only countries like that are like uh, when I was in Malaysia. Same thing, or Singapore, they do not tolerate even having a small amount of drugs. So their drugs policies are kind of like how they were in the U.S. at that time. And then he also spoke out against for the rights of gays and lesbians and the need for environmental protection. So again, protection against forests, I guess companies dumping trash, sewage into the ocean, the cutting of trees or unnecessary cutting of trees in certain areas. Continuing, those suffering from the effects of diabetes, so he got diabetes and he had a stroke. He continued to travel extensively, so extensively is a lot. I don't know how he traveled so much having those two issues, but he did. And he continued to publish too. But in April, 1997, at the age of 70, he 
He died of liver cancer at his home in the East Village in New York City. That brings us to the end of our lecture material for this week. But you know, I'm, I have two questions. Should I only do one? Should I be kind and let you go a few minutes early? Occasionally, I think last week I was a bit too tough. We'll see. I don't hear the students telling me anything. Again, my email, you can drop off the $1,000 deposit. So whiteboard. And again, too, if any of you need to talk since I'm not seeing you this quarter, send me an email, ask me a question. Tell me, hey, I'm having trouble with this parking ticket or I'm having trouble doing this or that. Maybe I can give you some advice. I'm always there for my students, okay? So I guess I'll be kind and this will be the last question for this week. Yay. I don't hear anybody saying, teacher, you're so kind. Uh, anyway, in his later years, he still spoke out against which issues. So let me extend this here for you. So there are certain issues similar to Mr. Baldwin a number of weeks back where he rallied against, right? Uh, what were the issues? Uh, men wearing pink shoes or women hitting their boyfriends like sandbags? I, I don't know. If you went through the election material, you know what it is. So let me give you a short minute there. Let me make my marking. Uh, 140 on the right side is done. Okay, so if you have the answer for that, good. And again, I wish everybody well. Stay safe, wear your masks, do your social distancing, be kind to each other. It's uh, very rare to have good friends. And if you're kind to people, you might get lucky and have some good friends, okay? All right. So that's it for the week, and uh, we shall talk again next week. Let me get the eraser here, erase this. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye to everyone else. Okay.